Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by DISA Global Solutions. DISA Global Solutions is a provider of workplace safety and compliance services with more than 30 years of experience. Every year, DISA helps thousands of companies make more informed staffing decisions by offering a broad array of industry-leading screening and compliance services. With DISA, you can maintain a strong DOT compliance program while keeping your face on the rest of your business. As part of our comprehensive compliance services, DISA will not, will not only supply you with official regulatory agency policies, but will help you complete and manage them too. Let us know if we can help you with any of the following agency policies and requirements. Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, Federal Railroad Administration, Federal Transit Administration, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and U.S. Coast Guard. We make sure you have the information and resources you need to conduct your day-to-day -day business. Today's presentation is entitled DOT Drug Testing Panel and Procedural Updates and qualifies for one professional development credit from SHRM and CCDAP. For those who have attended today's presentation in its entirety, you will receive information today following today's webinar on how to apply for those credits. Today's presentation will be presented by Frank Bernard and Nina French. Frank Bernard is a highly accomplished operations and compliance executive with a distinguished career at Walmart, the U.S. Department of Labor, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Frank is currently the Vice President of Ethics and Compliance at DISA Global Solution. Frank is responsible for translating DISA's compliance vision into actionable strategies that support client performance, enhance program maturity, and create competitive compliance advantages. These strategies encompass the compliance subject matter areas of DOT and transportation compliance, training and education, employee screening, and risk management. Nina French is the managing partner for the current consulting group with over 25 years of experience. She specializes in product and business development, drug testing marketing and strategy, and occupational health and wellness operations as part of an overall screening organization. Her consulting emphasis is on helping employee screening providers streamline operations, define their product portfolio and market in alignment with core business goals, launch new products, increase revenue, and retain existing clients. And it will now be our pleasure to hear from Frank Bernard. Thank you, Jessica. Um, today, I'd like to start off with beginning with the end in mind. So as we begin with the end in mind, I'll walk us through the agenda. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the purpose of this particular presentation. We're going to focus on changes for the employers, the important and new use of the new federal CCF, practical implications, and then towards the end, provide an opportunity to submit in uh, questions and answers that we can uh, get back to you in a timely manner. So as we talk about this agenda, at the end of this presentation today, you should walk away with several things. The first thing you should walk away with is an understanding of who is impacted by the DOT changes, what's required for these impacted parties, and you should have a greater understanding of where and why changes should be made as it relates to your DOT program. Our training today will not cover the details of the regulations, as these regulations are available on the DOT Gov site. Our presentation is to provide the cliff notes for you the cliff notes of what you need to know because the changes are coming fast. As we talk about the purpose of this pre presentation, there's been some confusion, and we've heard from our clients, confusion around the HHS, and as the HHS issued new regulations on January the 23rd of 2017. But as those on the phone are aware, these regulations didn't align with the DOT. The DOT issued the notice of proposed rulemaking on the same day. Thus, we've all been in suspense waiting for the final regulations to be published. The good news is that they've been published. The bad news is if you're not preparing for these January changes, they're coming fast, so you may have ch ch trouble or challenges. As we move forward, I'd like to focus us on two key things understanding the changes for the DOT employer, 
and understanding the effective date of the changes in their particular impact as we help prepare you for the, your organization for these changes. At this particular point in time, I'd like to turn the call over to Nina French. So let's start with, you know, sort of where Frank left off. The Department of Transportation um, applies to all of the agencies. So the rules that they set out applies to all of the agencies underneath them. And in general, and in the past, they've aligned with the federal mandatory guidelines. Um, like Frank mentioned, on January 23rd of la this past year, two things happened. The Department of Health and Human Services issued their new mandatory guidelines that apply to federal agencies. And then the DOT issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to sort of, that really sort of aligned with those but were not in effect. And notice of proposed rulemaking means here's what we're thinking of doing. Give us your comments and questions. And they gave a timeline that I believe was about the end of March where people were able to submit changes, challenges, questions, thoughts on anything in that notice of proposed rulemaking. And so they were received and reviewed in detail. And when, when Frank mentioned that there is, uh, you know, extensive regulatory information and you can go visit DOT.gov and you can find that information, every single, um, proposed change had comments and those comments are reviewed um, in detail by the DOT and explaining why the changes occurred exactly how they did or updates and responses to those comments from people in the industry. And so those are all available, look at them. But what we're going to go through today is really the overview of the changes. There are 14 separate changes. The changes are final, which means that comment period is done. Um, the one thing I will say is they're not exactly like the HHS changes, right? Um, but what it does do is it aligns that panel up with the Department of Health and Human Services. And I know for those of you who were waiting in that limbo period, there was some confusion about it. It does align it, but it also reinforces that urine testing is the only method allowed for drug testing, and saliva and breath are the only method allowed for alcohol testing. Where the HHS panel did have, or, or changes did have some discussion of oral fluid that was sort of left out there, this reinforces that right now, although those things are being looked at, they're not part of this regulatory change. So it's important that everybody understands that. We're going to go through these changes kind of in order of importance to some degree, but obviously so that you can, can really understand them, we're going to go through these in very sort of layman's term and hopefully make this all applicable to all of you who really just have to do this on a day-to-day -day basis and you just want the down and dirty. What do I have to do and when do I have to do it? So the most significant change, or I guess the most visible change, because I'm not sure it's not as significant as some of the other changes, but. Um, the most significant and visible change is the DOT panel change. The DOT amended the drug testing panel language to switch from the word opiates to the word opioids. And they did that to accommodate the testing of semi-synthetic opioids. So again, layman's term here, people. I'm not going to go through this. I'm, I'm not a doctor, so that makes it easy to not pretend to be one. But what it is is they are adapting the terminology so that they can include the drugs that many of us are hearing about on the 6 o'clock or the 5 o'clock news or on your blog feed, right? Hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, oxymorphone, those highly abused synthetic drugs are being added to opiates, and so they've changed it to be correct and accurate and changed the lingo to opioids. What's interesting is it's still going to be that same five drug panel. So when you talk about your DOT panel, you don't now have to count the number of drugs. They've always really only said it's a five drug panel, and that are the, those are the major categories, right? It is now opioids, amphetamines, PCP, cocaine, and THC. Under those categories of drugs, there are subdrugs, right? So now, instead of just having codeine and morphine, we have codeine, morphine, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, oxymorphone. In addition, just like, just like opioids, amphetamines has always included amphetamines and methamphetamine. And so, 
now they've added MDMA as an initial test analyte, and they've removed MDEA. And so, again, it just, it's, it's an update to the panel, and we're going to talk about where you're going to see that and what you're going to see it and sort of the impact in the upcoming slides. So this is what we referenced, a horse by the same name, it's still a five drug test panel. So uh, the, the five drug test panel first changed, I believe it was in 2010, was one of the more significant changes. And in that change, they modified um, some of the subdrugs. And But again, it's still that five drug panel. So in October 2010, we saw the, the five drug panel meet being marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, opiates, and fencyclidine. Under opiates, there's always been that confirmatory testing of a six monoacetylmorphine or six AM. Um, and that is specifically to look for heroin, but it always contained codeine and morphine. And under amphetamines, they had, in 2010, they added the initial drugs, MDMA, and the confirmation testing of MDA, MD, MDMA, and MDEA. So this has always been the case, five-drug panel. We're seeing that now. With these new changes, um, it is a five-drug panel. We're modifying the language to say opioids. We're adding those subdrugs of hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. And then under amphetamines, um, we are changing that metabolite of MDA and removing MDEA. Um, so significant, what it really is going to be most impactful is we're going to talk about the MRO process and the drugs they're testing for, but when you're on a day-to-day -day basis with your negative drug test, you're just going to need to be ready for that new panel and what it's going to look like when it comes across. Um, What's the difference we alluded to this? So opiates are a natural pain remedy. And when I talked about this in, with a group recently, somebody sent in a message and said, wait a second, heroin is actually synthesized. So take this in the way it's meant to be, right? Opiates are alkaloids derived from opium poppy, so the poppy seed. So you guys remember this all through the years, all going back to, you know, opium dens. But it is really the... the the drugs that are derived from that poppy plant, whereas opioids are synthetic pain medications. These are the things that are being manufactured by big pharma, right? They are being manufactured and they are, their active ingredients are made to, to mirror the effects of an opiate, but they're synthetic. Um, some of them are stronger. Some of them are not. Heroin is very strong, and it's not available to be um, prescribed in the United States. These, methadone, Percocet, oxycodone, you know, those are some of the the, um, the names by market, and then the drug, oxymorphone, for instance, is allotted. Some of them, um, most of them are prescribable. Some are very, very strong, and some are less strong, right? So. They kind of run the gamut, but really this was done in an effort to work with the epidemic we've got in the United States for drug abuse. Now, this is where this starts to get important for you as a safety manager or as an HR manager. And so pay close attention, if you will, to these changes and what they mean. So. The second change that I'm saying is maybe not quite as visible, but I believe of equal importance to you, is that the MRO rules have been modified, and they've said that the clarification of prescription means valid prescription under the Controlled Substances Act. That's language that has already been in Part 40. It's already there. They did it on purpose, right? They are, they are trying to underline to DOT employers that because marijuana is not allowed to be prescribed in most cases, we're going to talk about that, right, in the United States, when you have recreational marijuana states, and we do, we have, we have um, legal marijuana for medicinal purposes in 29 states right now, and we've got it available for recreational purposes in 28 states. The DOT does not care, 
right? So a medical certificate, a medical recommendation, um, or I'm sorry, a marijuana recommendation, a marijuana certificate, a marijuana card holder, they are not prescriptions for the DOT, and they will not be accepted by the MROs with any exception. Um, the MRO is now allowed to order a THCV test. Now, many of you who do high volumes are used to this. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. The MRO, when reviewing a drug test, is allowed to, to authorize and to have tested some additional tests. Now, historically, way back before 2010, it was that six monoacetyl morphine. Now that's done automatically, and like I said, that looks – and specifically identifies heroin, right? It is not morphine, it is not codeine, it is specifically heroin. And if a 6 mono morphine or a 6-AM comes up positive, you know it's heroin. There's, there's, nothing that, there's no prescription that can be given um, to the MRO to overturn that 6-AM positive. A DL isomer is something that also has been included for ever in the DOT regulations. And again, many of you have maybe not ever come past or come, come to deal with this, but it's a test that the MRO can order. And it basically, when they get a positive methamphetamine, they are looking to see um, a specific metabolite, and it's a D-methamphetamine. So there are some drugs on the market that come in an, a, a prescribable or a usable form that look like methamphetamine. And so the standard GCMS confirmations don't distinguish between those two forms of methamphetamine. So if during the interview the doctor believes that there is reason to order that test, he or she is going to order that test, the L isomer. That's not a change. That's something you guys probably ran across across at some point when you're running your program. What is a change is they've now added THCV. And in as much as I just said, there is no um, prescribable medical marijuana in, in the U.S., that's, there's an exception to that, right? It's not really necessarily true. So where you're seeing in Colorado, in Washington, in Washington, D.C., in Oregon, all of these medical marijuana cards, there have been exceptions to that always. Um, so the FDA has approved several drugs um, that are derivatives of THC um, or mirror that. And so they're synthetic cannabinoids. Marinol is the most common name, dronabinol. Um, is the is what the the technical name of the drug are, and they have been approved since the 80s. There's another one called Sesamet. They've been approved since the mid 80s, and they are both used in general for nausea, vomiting associated with cancer, chemotherapy, anorexia, or um, weight loss for AIDS patients. So they've been around for a very long time. What the THCV test does is allow the the MRO when they see a THC positive, um, to test that specimen to see if it is indeed one of these FDA approved and prescribable drugs or if it is the use of any other form of THC by that person. And so it's important that that's been added. And what I will reiterate when we're talking about these additional drugs is as an employer, you need to allow the MRO the discretion to do that. You cannot prevent it from happening due to cost or complication in your workplace. You need to allow it to happen. You need to allow the MRO to do it. And you cannot stop them from doing it for any reason if they deem it necessary as part of the, the um, medical review process. So it's important. They are not going to come up all the time, we don't suppose. Some of you, like I said, haven't ever seen even a DL isomer test. But many of you who do a larger volume, and as we look at the issue of, of marijuana legalization across the country, we are likely to see some of those THCV tests when these new rules go into effect. Um, 
Now, let's keep moving in what are the MRO and changes and, and some of the impacts to you from a safety perspective. This is something that I think has not been as widely talked about since we've seen these new regulatory changes, but it's important. Um, so the one thing is that the MRO is not going to be allowed to, pres to accept a photo of a prescription label as a valid proof of prescription. And some R MROs did that, some did not. Um, but now with Photoshop, with all of the different editing tools that are so readily available and so very, very good, the MRO is going to be required to call the pharmacy in order to ensure that the prescription is legal and valid. Now, legal and valid is something else we're going to talk about here. So um, I had to pause and put that aside. But um, when you're talking about pr the prescription in a, in a DOT program, they're going to have to make a phone call. So I want you to be cognizant of the impact, the possible impact of that on um, your turnaround time. Right? And so many of you know what your standard turnaround times are. Um, if you're using an electronic chain of custody, you can see when a specimen was collected. You can see, you know, oftentimes when it gets to the laboratory. And so you have a sense of when you're going to get that final result back from the MRO. Um, you know if it goes on longer that there's a possibility that it's undergoing MRO review. Um, now, because MROs are going to have to make those phone calls to the pharmacy and speak to the pharmacist, you can anticipate that there's a possible delay until the pharmacist and the MRO process gets up and running and used to that. Um, you also have to remember, when you call your local pharmacy for whatever need, you know, press 8, press 0, press 2, press 7, now hold and you're the 12th person in queue. Do you want us to call you back? We can hold your place in queue and call you back. Lots of that's going to occur. They need to speak to the pharmacist. And so it's just important that you understand that that's going to be part of the prescription verification process. And it may impact your turnaround time. I want you to remember as well that we've just added four new drugs that have prescriptions. And so you will see impact to that as well. How significant? Really none of us knows. Nobody at DISA knows. Obviously, they've, they're operationally ready for this. but. Our industry is being operationally ready um, and, you know, the, the local pharmacist being ready to take on those additional phone calls doesn't necessarily mean they're ready, right? So, so just be aware of it. There's four new drugs that are prescribable and now there's this addition to the um, verification process. Further, and this is the one point that I think is super significant for you to hear, MROs are not allowed to question an employer's doctor if they believe the doctor prescribed a specific legal medication too liberally and the age of the prescription is not defined. And so a prescription can be an old prescription. So I often say on these, these um, presentations, I'm the mother of four daughters. My oldest is 15 and my twins are 10. I can have a prescription from that event and give it to the MRO, and the MRO can reverse my drug test or should reverse my drug test. And so as an HR person, super important for you to hear that. As a safety person, super important for you to hear that because you need to be thinking about the impact of your DOT testing on the safety of your workplace. You need to be thinking about it from an HR policy perspective. You need to be thinking about it from a non-DOT policy perspective, right? So in many cases, people have to find a prescription as a valid prescription within one year. Now the DOT has opened that up and said you can use prescriptions that are older. And what an MRO cannot do, guys, is say, yeah, this is used consistently with what it was prescribed for, right? So an MRO doesn't take that next step. They're not allowed to in a DOT program, and it's beyond the scope of their ability even in a non-DOT program, right, to be able to say, yes, this was prescribed 15 years ago. She's clearly using it for some other purpose and shouldn't be. That can't happen. So the MRO is going to take the prescription and they can reverse that drug test. But that is when we get into the idea of, you know, fitness for duty outside. And this is what you've got to be prepared for as, an, an, as a DER. The MROs retain both their right and their obligation to report medical information to a third party, 
to determine if they are within their reasonable medical judgment, if there is a significant safety risk. So let's take me as that, in that scenario again, right? If I am in a DOT safety sensitive position and the MRO finds that I have high dose, uh, that I have a positive for an opiate and the only reason that I have that hydrocodone prescription is because I gave birth 10 years ago and they gave it to me when I was returning from the hospital, they then may take this next added step. And so you, as an employer, need to be thinking about what are you going to do. If they give you a safety warning, what are you going to do? If you look at the second bullet, think about the impact and do your timing as well. So the new process is that the employee has five business days after the verified negative result is reported to have a prescribing physician contact the MRO. The MRO and the prescribing physician can determine if the medications can be changed to one that doesn't pose a significant safety risk or make the employee medically unqualified. So this would be where I've now given, you know, the, the MRO says, I'm going to give a safety warning. You cannot perform your safety-sensitive job, right? After five days, the MRO can report the result as a safety concern. So I don't think Nina should be performing her safety-sensitive job. The MRO then immediately reports the downgraded test for result as a verified negative. So they are going to report it to you as the DER as a safety concern. Then you're going to get through your system a negative. And then they may give you additional medical information. They can report the medical information to third parties before the five day is ended if the prescribing physician gets in contact with the MRO, right? So basically, some of you call that like a non-contact positive. Um, but the MRO can give the doctor five days to get in touch with them. Whether or not the doctor gets in touch with them within that five days, then they can report to you the safety concern, the downgraded negative result, and then you as the DER need to understand what your obligations are. Um, and again, I, I tell you, look at that from a DOT position because if you remove that person because they're not allowed to perform a safety sensitive role, then you've got to pick it up on this next end and say, what am I going to do from a, an HR role, right? Does that mean I'm going to accommodate them in a non-safety sensitive position? Do we do that? So you've got to be looking these, the, at these in terms of your HR policy, your DOT policy, and your non-DOT policies, all of your HR policies across the board in parallel. Um, and so, again, where Frank opened us up by saying, um, the good news is it's finally here, and the bad news is it's coming really fast. You've got to be looking at all of those different policies and making sure that you provide yourselves, your supervisors, any other DERs within your organization, what you are going to do in those cases where you're notified of a safety concern um, for a DOT employee. What are you going to do then from an HR perspective? It's important to remember that the DOT does not discuss things like that, right? They t discuss whether or not the person can perform a safety-sensitive role, but what they do not discuss is what do you do from an employment standpoint, right? Are you going to terminate them? Are you going to um, accommodate them? They don't discuss that. So you've got to be looking at that from an HR perspective. Um, those are what I said, I believe, to be really the most impactful and significant changes in the new regulations. And so, um, you know, Hopefully you've got out your pen and you're doing a to-do list and making sure that you've, you've understood what the changes are and how they're going to impact you and what you've got to look at in terms of your policies and procedures. And then we'll talk about it at the end here as a reminder, but don't forget training, right? It's important that people who receive these results understand what the impact is. I will sort of insert here that many cases from an HR perspective have been challenged and lost not because of any issues with the policy or procedures, but it's really the application of those procedures and making sure that they're consistent. And so that's going to be critical with any DOT and non-DOT workplace testing program. Um, so now we're going to pause and move on, right? So what are some of the other changes that have occurred that really require mention and will impact you, but perhaps not as greatly as those first few we saw? So the first one is the addition of new fatal flaws. Um, this is the one where we saw that the comments 
that occurred during the NPRM comment period actually modified what the final result was or the final regulation was. So the DO2 had added three new fatal flaws to the four that already existed. Um, and the fatal flaws are issues that cause a drug test to be canceled. So the first one is that if there's no CCF, the second one is if two separate collections were performed using one CCF. And what you most often were seeing that is when um, someone had to, you know, maybe a shy bladder in the beginning and then they provided a second specimen and they didn't have a second chain of custody form. And so the collector sends the um, specimen to the laboratory and they have both, you know, the incomplete first specimen and then the second specimen. So that is where we most often saw that, but that is now a fatal flaw. Um, and then finally, there was no specimen submitted to the laboratory with the CCF, but a specimen was actually collected. And so those are really exceptions, much like the four fatal flaws that already existed. Um, there are also flaws that are non-fatal flaws. The team at DISA is aware of what they are, and we'll report them accurately. But you, as an employer, based on how you're receiving these results, if they're part of your package, if they're part of a individual result into an applicant tracking software, you've got to be aware that those changes are coming and you may see them and they'll be different than what you received prior to these new regulations coming in. There's some collection clarification, and again, this is sort of an exception, not a rule, but the DOT amended paragraph 40.193B4 to address what a collector does when an employee provides a specimen, a questionable specimen. Um, and so this is in the case where they thought there was tampering or they thought there was someone trying to adulterate their specimen. Um, they didn't, and the employee didn't provide a second specimen um, under the direct observation. So that is still in place. You need to remember it. Collection sites in these instances need to provide direct observation by a same gender collector. Um, and they wait for a period of up to three hours. What they clarified is that the collector is to discard any specimen previously collected. So then the MRO is only going to report the outcome of the required evaluation. This seems tedious for those of you who've never run into it. For those of you who have run into it, you're saying, oh, thankfully they finally did this. Um, it is super confusing and has historically been very confusing to employers and to DERs when you have that first specimen sent to the lab and you get a result. And that result, remember, may be negative because this person was suspected of an issue of tampering in many cases. And so, you know, that might have a different result than what the full collection sample was. And so they are going to discard that. It's not going to go through the laboratory process and you're going to just receive the MRO, I should say, and then you as the employer will just receive that full um, sufficient specimen test result. and. Um, so, again, for employers, that's the impact. If you're a collector and you happen to be on the phone, it's important to, to understand that those are the rules moving forward. Um, it generally was the rule in the past, but now it's been clarified. Um, another one that many of you who are larger DOT employers have um, are aware of, some of you who are smaller may not be aware of it, um, unless you've been doing this for a long time before they changed these rules back in the day of blind specimen. But a blind specimen is basically a quality control specimen. So what a blind specimen means is that the team at DISA, when required based on your size and the volume of tests that you did um, for DOT employers, would if they were doing it for you, so every once in a while I'll hear of an employer who actually did their own QC specimens. But basically sending in laboratory specimens that they know the result of. So you're buying this urine and it is, 
is sent to the lab. It looks like a regular chain of custody. Nothing indicates to the laboratory that this is an, a blind specimen or a QC sample. And then the lab has to analyze the um, specimen and send the results to you or to DISA, right? DISA then looks at it and says, okay, yeah, we spent we sent 100 specimens into the laboratory. 90 of them or 80 of them were just straight negatives. And they all came back and they're straight negatives. We had 10 that were THC positive. Yep, they came back and they identified THC. And then, you know, a smattering of different results with those other 10 specimens. So it really was testing the laboratory to ensure that the results were coming back um, correct, right? It's QC. Well, the DOT is not letting the labs off the hook by any means, but they're actually letting the employers and third-party administrators alleviate that burden of having to do that. And the reason for it is that the laboratories are just highly controlled and inspected. So the Department of Health and Human Services using their, um, it's the National Laboratory Certification Program, the NLCP, they have to do all of these. So they're still going to be required to the inspections, both the physical inspections then the, the, that are semi-annual. They are still required to receive what they call performance tests, which are quality control tests by a different name, right? Every quarter, um, if there's any discrepancy, they have to be investigated, and then any corrective action has to be taken. And that's for them to keep their SAMHSA certification. So it is significant that these labs do this. Um, the reason the DOT said it as well is they also have in place bottle A and bottle B. So, you know, under a DOT program, you are collecting a split specimen. 45 milliliters of that urine is collected. 30 milliliters is in bottle A, 15 milliliters in bottle B. If an employee or a donor questions the validity of their specimen, he or she can request that that bottle B be sent to an alternate SAMHSA certified laboratory and that that split specimen, that's what we call it, the split bottle is tested and it confirms what the bottle A confirmed. And so that is also for the donor or the employer should you, you know, want to. You, that, that remedy is there if the donor wants to um, invoke that right. And again, I will reiterate to those of you who are um, DERs on the phone, when that happens, you need to let it happen. So the request will come into the MRO most likely um, to, you know, and then DISA will handle it and likely notify you, but you cannot stop that process from happening. Um, you know, you can't say, oh, we don't even think we're gonna hire this person. Don't do that. You have to do it. Um, if there's anything that you want to deal with from an HR perspective, that's separate from that process, and you need to let bottle B be tested at the request of the donor. Um, and that's all in place. So, you know, th those are no worries. Um, it's just that if you were dealing with the blinds, they go away, and that's great. Um, next, we're moving on to the listserv requirement. Again, this is not a requirement for you, an employer, but it is a requirement for all of the rest of us who are actually facilitating the testing of the specimens facilitating the collection. So it applies to SAPs, MROs, STTs, BATs. And basically what the DOT has said in the past, if we came in to inspect you, Mr. Collector or Mrs. Collector, um, you had to show us that you had a part 40 in your hands. You could, you could provide us with what was in the past very dog-eared, highlighted um, copies, paper copies of Part 40. What the DOT has had for years now is um, the ODAPC list serve. It's a free subscription, and they are now requiring that all of the providers listed in that first bullet subscribe so that they can get updates. And that's really what it is. It, 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 it gives you access to all of the updates that come out from ODAPSI, which is the Office of Drug and Alcohol Policy, right? So they send out updates as a provider in the industry. You are going to get those updates communicated very quickly, um, and you're going to have access to all of the um, 
information you need online. You can do it on your, you know, your smartphone, you can do it on your tablet, you can do it on your computer. You can certainly go in there and print stuff out if you want to, but it is a requirement. If you are an employer and you are not required, I still suggest you do it. Um, it makes a lot of sense. It keeps you up to date. Um, I know the team at DISA is really good at getting you updates as soon as they come out, but it never hurts for you to get them directly from the source at ADAPSI um, and then work with the team at DISA to help you translate them into what does it really mean um, and to you know, normal speak a bit. A um, couple other things that went on. Um, the DOT made clarification to the specimen type, so we talked about that. Um, but what they did was clarify that only urine drug testing specimens are allowed, that they have to be screened and confirmed at an HHS certified laboratory. They further went on to clarify that point of collection testing or point of care or instant test, POCT, whatever you call it, they're not allowed um, for, for uh, urine testing. Hair testing. Oral fluid testing for drugs are not currently permitted under Part 40. Many of you are going to say, wait a second, I thought hair and urine were, or I'm sorry, hair and um, oral fluid testing is allowed. Not for a DOT program. Um, alcohol saliva tests are allowed. So there is a list of approved alcohol screening devices that can be used in a DOT program. And then breath can be used for confirmation. So again, if you are doing post-accident reasonable suspicion, random testing, you can use those approved screening devices, and I'm doing air quotes, right, because some people say instant. Um, you then, if it's a negative, you're good to go, as long as it's a DOT-approved device, and that's published on the DOT website. Any changes are published to that as well. So the um, uh, the alcohol screening devices can be used, but a confirmation test would need to occur. So if that does not screen as a straight negative, then there are rules that you have to abide by and have the alcohol test confirmed using a breath alcohol test. Okay, so um, important to know that. As a side note, the DOT is currently, and ODAPSI is currently looking at oral fluid and hair testing, and we know that, they publish those things, um, but we don't anticipate seeing it very soon, you know, and again, everybody's definition of soon varies pretty dramatically, so this is the government. Um, they've been looking at it, um, and so we may see an NPRM about either one of those topics come out very shortly, but we don't know, but they are under review, but not currently allowed in a DOT program. DNA testing, another thing that um, the DOT clarified, it was never allowed. This is not a change in so much as a solidification of the rules. So the DOT already prohibited the use of DNA testing on urine specimen. The new updates now emphasize it. Um, so they added a single sentence that in, into Part 40 that states that DNA testing of urine specimens is not authorized and no permission will be given at this time. So I love the fact that ODAPSI has really, you know, looked at the regulations and looked at how our industry has changed for those of us who have been it for a long, long time. They look at it and, and they put in language like at this time. So we don't know what that possible change in technology could be years out. Um, but for now, they're reaffirming that, and it must be because they've received so many requests or questions for it. So it cannot be used for any other reason, and it's important that you just know that if, in case it comes up in your workplace. And then finally, the DOT put in some technical updates. So just this is a mature industry now, and so they updated section headers 
to reflect the addition of the four new semi-synthetic opioids. They changed dates, right? So there were some dates that have passed, and they've modified those and taken them out. Um, they rephrased certain sections. Um, so the one that we point out here that I think is the most significant is just regarding codeine and morphine. Um, and so there's still the requirement that if someone tests positive for codeine or morphine, in many cases, you have to show clinical evidence um, of abuse. So they've, re they've, they've rephrased that and made clarifications of what happened. So let's say someone tested positive for 15,000 nanograms of codeine and then says, yeah, I, I, you know, I have a hydrocodone positive now under the new regs. Um, so now you've got somebody who's got a positive for 15,000 nanograms of codeine and you've got somebody who's got a positive for hydrocodone and they cannot verify it and reverse it. In that case, the MRO is going to issue that result as a positive for hydrocodone, but they have to verify the test negative for codeine unless they see clinical evidence of abuse. What does that translate to you guys as employers and safety managers? The positive for hydrocodone, is all you need to understand that that person cannot be in a safety sensitive role and the negative for codeine is not is you know secondary you likely wouldn't even know in this case um that there was a lab positive for codeine unless the MRO found clinical evidence of abuse and i'm going to reiterate at this point that DOT testing and drug testing in general in a workplace does not mean that a person does not have any drugs in his or her system. The cutoff levels in both a screening test and a confirmation test are there for a reason. There is medical and scientific reasoning when they're developing the panel in a drug test. And so what it means is that the in, the, the drug was not in the person's system at or above the confirmation cutoff level before it gets reported to you. And in the case of codeine and morphine, it is that the drug, if it was there for just a codeine or morphine positive, that there was clinical evidence of abuse. Okay, so all of these things are nuances, and when you're doing your drug testing on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't come up, but, you know, the team at DISA is really striving to make sure that all of you understand the basis of a really good compliant drug testing and DOT testing program. And so it's a refresher opportunity for all of us. And, and, and it sort of ties in to some of the other um, reminders we're going to give you here at the very end of this presentation. But before we do that, um, there's some other things in that last bullet lots of different little changes to the appendices and to certain places where they updated the four new semi-synthetic opioids, they removed that MDMA, and then some other technical updates correcting like web links and things. So lots of it, it's important that you know it, but those are not as likely to need to be reviewed in detail by any of you who are running the program. Now. As we wrap this up, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the federal chain of custody form because although it is not part of these new regulations, you, you know, they're hand in hand. You can't know one without knowing the other. So many of you know that in August, the federal chain of custody form changed to align with those HHS changes that went into effect on October 1st. So on October 8th, the new revised federal drug testing chain of custody form was um, approved. Immediately after, all of you who are DOT employers started saying, well, do we use it? We can't use it. And, and so the DOT clarified then that you were not to, to use it. So what the rule is, now the DOT covered employees should begin to use the new forms on January 1, 2018. However, for those of you who have piles of chain of custodies, you do not need to destroy those chain of custodies because you're authorized to continue to use the old CCF until midnight on, on June 30th, 2018.
So use up the supply, or I encourage you to look at the use of an electronic chain of custody, right? It's going to make everybody's life easier in many ways. But if the old form is used up until July 1, there's no no, there's no memorandum for the record that's required. The MRO is just going to process it. The lab is going to change it over and test for the new panel. Um, and so you're not going to have an issue. If on the flip side you happen to use the new one before then, we've only got a, a, you know, a, a little bit of time before January 1st, but if in the next couple of weeks you were to use the new one, as long as the testing was consistent with Part 40, so that means you know, none of those expanded opiates until midnight um, on January 1st. So 12 a.m. January 1st, if they did the five panel test, you're still okay. And once they flip, you're okay. So important date to notice. Again, I encourage you to look at the electronic chain of custody um, and because that is where you are going to um, save yourself time, money, headache um, by using up the, you know, use your old chain of custodies and then look at electronic chain. So key dates, um, Frank is going to jump in here with me in a minute. Uh, key dates, the new federal regulations go into effect January 1st, 2018. And so again, careful what you wish for because it is here. And to reiterate what I just said, the new federal chain of custody form can be used until June 30th, 2018, but the new change will um, go into effect and you can use the old forms just like we covered. Now, Frank, are you ready to talk about slide 25? Yes, Nina. Um, one of the things that's really clear for us as, as we move forward and, uh, and we want to be focused around on, of, of course, is changes you'll see. Uh, you're going to see changes in the nomenclature and, and, and programming changes. As we talk about those programming changes, of course, um, we're going to see opiates changing the op opioids, and we're going to see, see the new panel reflected, including the new drugs and the analytes, and of course the new fatal flaws and the new lab panel numbers, uh, as well as uh, this will be reflective in the MIS and statistical reports. Uh, next, next slide, please. And and as we move forward, uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to reference and focus the team on is uh, if you have not had uh, your policy updated from a DOT and non-DOT standpoint, it's going to be very likely that, that your policy is going to be, uh, of, of course, out of compliance. Um, so thus, you need to consider several things. You need to consider um, the, the impact of state laws, and you also need to, to consider um, uh, the HHS panels and the SAMHSA panels. And part of considering this is also considering your, you know, the current supply of federal CCFs that you have. You know, when we talk about the federal, the, the supply of federal CCFs, I'm encouraging everyone under the sound of my voice on this call to really give some strong considerations to adoption of the uh, electronic chain of custody form. Uh, consider this conversion. This is a conversion that I think will be very important as we talk about turnaround time. Uh, I suspect that uh, the adoption will allow for a, a greater impact or less of an impact as it relates to turnaround time. I'll encourage everyone moving forward to, to review the employee and supervisor training requirements and, of course, determine appropriate communication and training that may be needed going forward. Uh, with that being and said, uh, Frank, can I step in on the, the state law impact for you? Yes. Because I was going to cover this and I threw you in fast. So I'm, I'm going to cover this very quickly and then I'm going to have Frank jump back in to re reiterate some of the stuff we went through. But it's important for those of you who, who do this when we talked in the very beginning about state law or about your non-DOT policy and Frank just reiterated the importance of policy again and again. Can't do it more. But even though the DOT regs do not apply to your non-DOT program, there are many states, we've got some listed here, but there are many states whose state laws, either the mandatory or the voluntary laws, refer to the DOT regulations. So on this slide, you will see Maryland and Montana, 
you know, Maryland, it's specific to safety sensitive employees. Montana, it is, um, it, it applies to a broader range, right? And these voluntary laws, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, all of them have different rules and regulations that apply, but they refer to the DOT regulations. What we don't have listed here is that many of the, many other states, so there's really 20 total states um, plus Puerto Rico, where they reference either the DOT, SAMHSA, or HHS panel in their state regs. So although the DOT doesn't apply, and if you were to call the DOT and say, hey, what do I do? I, I'm an employer in Montana, and I, I understand we have to use DOT mandatory panel. The DOT is going to say, not my business. I don't have anything to do with it. What's important is that you know if your state, apply, if your state refers to DOT, SAMHSA, or HHS, then you are going to have to look at your changes to your state testing. What is also important to know is that where the team at DISA is going to know on January 1, DOT results that come in the door are going to switch to that new panel. All the labs are ready for that. They're prepared for that. They're aware of it. But what you don't know, what they don't know is what you're testing for, and sorry, I probably should have moved ahead for you guys, but they don't know, for instance, if you are a, if you're using the Arkansas voluntary law. And so it's important that you all look at when you're testing, what you're testing for, and what laws are applicable to your individual workplace, and you notify the team at DISA if you are modifying your panel to because you fall under one of those laws in one of those states. And so I wanted to jump in because I, I turned it over to, to Frank a bit early. He, we're going to get back to policy, but again, this was about the DOT changes, but every time the DOT ch makes a change in, in workplace drug testing, there's downstream impact to your non-DOT program. So sorry about that, Frank. I'm jumping in, but I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk a little bit about um, policy and some wrap-up. All right, thank you, Nina. Uh, really clear, guys, and I think Nina did a fantastic job of saying it. Uh, as, as we saw on the last slide, DOT changes are often referenced in state law, and in many states, they're also referenced in the HHS panel perspective and as it, as it relates to SAMHSA. If you have not updated your DOT or non-DOT policy, it is very likely out of compliance. So I would encourage you to take a strong look at it. Most cases, as you're well aware, against employers are won or lost based on the strength of the policy and, of course, the application of the company's procedures and policy. I submit to you that consistency and application is the key. When you talk about that consistency, you should also focus on the training of your supervisors and employees as well. Policy and compliance, as you well, are, well know, are never urgent or pressing <laughs> until they become urgent and pressing and then by then, it's usually too late. A problem has probably already arisen. And of course, you know, that can be a very costly mistake. So in conclusion, as we move forward, there are several things that I'd like, you, like for you to remember. Please remember that the new DLT panel is effective January 1st, 2018. The date for the new CCF form is July the 1st, 2018, but the panel will automatically switch at the lab on January the 1st. I would encourage you to consider switching to electronic forms now to make your transition easier. As you're aware, the new panel will result in more lab positives, but this may not actually translate into reported positives. It is very important to make sure you have a policy in place and you're ready for safety concern notifications from the MRO. There needs to be a policy and a process in place. As it relates to the obligation of the employer, it is the employer's obligation to make sure that the subcontractors are in compliance. Finally, please remember that here at DISA, we cannot automatically change your state panel. You must contact us at DISA to have those particular changes made. And as it relates to contacting us and moving forward, we have, if you'll advance the slide, um, uh, email address transport, transportation sales at disa.com. Please submit in all questions that you may have, and I commit to you that we will respond to all questions in a timely and appropriate manner. Once again, transportation sales at disa.com. 
for any questions that you may have as it relates to this particular presentation. With that being said, as we run up against time, I'm going to uh, turn the call back over to Jessica, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Frank, and of course, thank you to Nina. On behalf of DESA Global Solutions, we hope that you found today's presentation informative and helpful. Any questions that you have submitted for today's present presenters um, should have been entered into the Q&A section. If you do have a question still today uh, that you have not submitted, please feel free to do so before exiting the call. And regardless of whether you entered your question earlier or right now, we will have a representative reply to you in a timely manner. This presentation was recorded and you will receive instructions informing you how to access the recording. Additionally, this presentation qualifies for one professional development credit from SHRM and CCDAP for those who attended today's presentation in its entirety. If you are interested in applying for this credit and have met this requirement, please use the, the email address credit at Current Consulting Group to apply for this credit and you will receive that information within 24 to 48 hours. Again, if you have met the requirement and you are interested in applying for these credits, please send your request to credit at current consultinggroup.com and I've gone ahead and put that information on the slide for you so that you don't have to copy it down furiously, but that it is there available to you and I'll keep this slide up and give you ample time to copy it down. Um, thank you again for your attendance at today's webinar presentation and this concludes today's recorded portion of the webinar.